Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Think of a time in your life when you were seriously tempted. Not like you looked at a candy bar at a grocery store and decided not to buy it that day, but a time where you really, really, really wanted to do something and you knew not only in your conscience that it was wrong, but you knew from what God had told you it's not something you should want or do. Maybe you were tempted by greed for money or things. Maybe you were tempted sexually to live in a way that God did not design. Maybe you were tempted to sacrifice someone else and their reputation to advance yourself or your own interests. Maybe you were tempted to steal something that you couldn't afford or didn't belong to you. How did you do as you recall your temptations? How did you do when you were tempted? Now, with the big stuff, it might be easy, right? I was really angry with my classmate, and I, I just really wanted to punch him in the face, but I didn't. Good job. That's good. Don't want to d diminish that. You shouldn't do that. But Jesus, as we learned a few weeks back in the Sermon on the Mount, said the anger in your heart that you gave into was a sin. The truth is, you gave in. So did I. Not every time, but if we really want to get into the details, our record is not very good. We give in more than we want to admit. Give in to frustration and anger, jealousy and hatred, violence, greed. Just take a look around you in the world and you see that this is a common malady that human beings suffer from. You and I were Old Testament Israel. I am Old Testament Israel. We are wandering in the wilderness of sin. And we are there because we are ungrateful, selfish, and we want what we want and not what God wants. But fortunately, today in our gospel reading, we're hearing about a new Israel. And this new Israel does what we cannot. So to set the stage to really understand why this is the text that's been chosen in the historical church for the beginning of the season of Lent, right, a season of 40 days where we are fostering repentant and contrite hearts over our sinfulness, we really need to go back to the Old Testament and look at God's great act of deliverance there in the book of Exodus. You see, God saved his people from slavery to the Egyptians, and he delivered them with a mighty hand. I think sometimes I don't really get the impact of the ten plagues, or as, Jesus, as God calls them from the burning bush, his wonders, because I'm not really there witnessing it, but you can imagine. He's powerful. He's righteous. And he's saving his people. Well, he's the, he does the deed. He saves his people from their slavery into Egypt. He rescues them from their pursuers who are trying to still cling on by taking them through the waters of the Red Sea. And then they get to the wilderness. And as I asked the children in the children's message, how long did it take before the temptation to complain arose and they gave in and complained to Moses, and Moses told them, you're not really complaining to me, you're complaining to God. And I believe in that part of the text, it specifically says the amount of time, it's not very long. You'd think the spectacle of splitting an ocean in two and walking through on dry ground would store up at least three or four weeks of credibility for God. Not so with us. So they're in the wilderness now, and they're complaining. They complain. The first thing they complain, they say, you've brought us out here to die. Where's the food? Back in Egypt, I mean, we were slaves, but, I mean, we had good food. They didn't have good food. 
They were looking at things with rose-colored glasses. So they say God brought them out there to die. And this happens repeatedly, not only in their wandering in the wilderness, but even after he delivers them to the promised land. The people complain and give in to the temptation. So God, rather than take them straight into his promised land, has them wander around in the wilderness until a certain group of them are going to die. He originally, he wants to just wipe them out, and Moses pleads on behalf of the people of Israel and on behalf of God's steadfast love. And so he says, because you have said this, I will relent. And then he says this in Numbers chapter 14. But truly as I live and as all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord, none of the men who have seen my glory and my signs that I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and yet have put me to the test these ten times and have not obeyed my voice shall see the land that I swore to give to their fathers. And none of those who despise me shall see it. We are Old Testament Israel. If you didn't know what that meant before, now you know. Not a compliment. Not a great thing. God has indeed, like he did to them, delivered us with mighty wonders and works. The cross, where he took his sin upon, our sin upon himself, and paid the price of God's just wrath in our place. The empty tomb where he rose victorious from the dead, freeing us forever from our enslavement to sin. And our baptism, where he carried us through the waters to erase the last stains of sin that clung to us. How long does it take you to give in to complaining to God? when things don't go your way. I would wager a guess that it takes a shorter time than you want to admit it does for me. So why is it then that we're not hearing these same words of God about how none of us who have witnessed his wonders and still test him are going to die in the wilderness? That's what happened to Old Testament Israel. And if we're Old Testament Israel, things don't look so good for us. But the reason that we don't hear those words is there's a new Israel. And he has come to do the thing that is needed, the thing that we cannot. It's in our gospel reading today, this new Israel, Jesus, the nation of God's people in one man, as Paul explains in his epistle reading today, he is driven into the wilderness in order to be tempted by Satan. Now you may recall from our sermon about the baptism of Jesus, he begins to stand in the place of sinners right then and there. Because this was a baptism of repentance. Jesus doesn't have anything to repent of. He is the perfect Son of God. But he has stood in your place to receive that baptism. And right after that, this is the text. Right after the baptism of Jesus, the Holy Spirit descending like a dove, God the Father saying, this is my Son with whom I am well pleased, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So his standing in the place of the people of God continues. The timetable of Lent is based on the trials of Jesus in the wilderness. He fasted 40 days and nights, no food, no water. That's why Lent is the timetable it is, and that's why it has the ethos that it does. A time of self-denial, a time of repentance and contrition. But how is it that Jesus withstanding the temptations of the devil actually saves us. Because we've already understood and admitted that we're the Old Testament Israel. I mean, we didn't listen. We tested God. We didn't trust in his words. We didn't trust in his promises. But Jesus stands in place of that Old Testament Israel. He stands in your place before God. 
He, went, he underwent a sinner's baptism. He withstood all the trials and temptations that sin has to offer common to man. He knows precisely what you're going through because he went through it himself and yet remained perfect. He was the human being God always intended humans to be, perfectly obedient in a loving relationship with their Heavenly Father. And so he must do all the things that we could not. He must endure the temptation of the adversary, the enemy of God, the great deceiver, because we could not. Because he's preparing a life and a perfect righteousness that he intends to gift to you freely. So we know what happened after God delivered the Old Testament Israel. So what happens now with Jesus? Well, he endures three temptations by Satan. The first, bread. Turn these stones into bread. Now, if you're familiar with your Old Testament, that brings back manna. When the Israelites complained to God about dying in the wilderness, he sent them bread from heaven. And the temptation of the devil here is that he wants Jesus to use his divine power to serve himself, which is the opposite of what Jesus has come to do. Don't expend your energy on these, great, these people who are ungrateful. Use it for yourself. Take care of your own needs. The second one is he tests God. He wants him to test God. God has said these things to you. He's promised that if you throw yourself down, he's going to catch you so your feet don't strike a stone. Why don't you see if it's true? In the Old Testament, Israel, God had promised to deliver them to a promised land flowing with milk and honey, and yet they complained. First it was food, now it's about water. We go back to Exodus chapter 17. And they complain about dying of thirst. Did you bring us out into the desert so that we and our livestock would die of thirst? And Moses says, what am I going to do with these people, God? And God in his mercy says, strike that rock over there with the staff that I've given you. And water will, will flow from it. And so he does. But then Moses names that place Meribah, which is the Hebrew word for to test. Because the people tested God. And then the ultimate temptation. He brings to the forefront, the devil does, in this temptation of Jesus, the main question, the relationship of God's people with God. And he tempts Jesus to worship him. And he tempts him by saying, see all of the kingdoms of this earth, I will give them to you if you bow down and worship me. Old Testament Israel in the wilderness of sin. They got a little bored waiting for Moses to come down from Mount Sinai, and so they got all their gold together and they made a golden calf and began to worship it. And if you know more about the Old Testament, you will know that when they get to the promised land, they repeatedly fail to worship God and God alone. So how does Jesus do? We heard how Old Testament Israel does. How does Jesus do? Well, this new Israel, our Lord Jesus Christ, he responds to the temptation to use his power for his own needs. He says live, that man doesn't live on bread alone, but they live from every word that comes from the mouth of God. In other words, I'll trust in him and his words and his promises. Second temptation, the new Israel, he's one for one so far. Do not put the Lord your God to the test. I trust his word is Jesus' response to the devil. I don't need to test it. I believe it by itself. Two for two. For the third temptation, the new Israel, Jesus says, Be gone, Satan. There is one God, and you shall worship and serve him knockout punch. Here, Jesus says, he is God. I'm going to do whatever he says. So get out of here. So because of this new Israel, Jesus, who stands in your place and mine, 
He stands in the place of the sinful, grumbly, complaining, weak people of God. And he is strong and perfect. Loving and perfectly obedient in the way we were always meant to be. But as we learn from our Old Testament reading from the very beginning, we were not. Jesus succeeds in being the people of God perfectly in our place. So dear friends in Christ, when we read today's account, it is meant to give you hope in the certain future you have because Israel's champion, Jesus, holds the field in victory. He took what the great enemy had to offer and defeated him. And then he goes on to defeat him again and again and again in his ministry, all the way up until he does the final killing blow by dying on the cross and rising victorious over the worst that sin has to offer, death. So as we enter into the season of Lent, yeah, we're thinking about our sins and our failures. We're thinking about the fact that we're Old Testament Israel. It doesn't take long for us to complain about God to God, even though he's done mighty works in our midst. We give in to temptation. But in Lent, we seek to foster broken and contrite hearts, not to beat ourselves up uselessly, not to put ourselves back into the despair that the wilderness of sin brings, but so that we can clearly see what God has done. See, this is done, this ritual observance, this mindfulness of sin is done in the context of our faith and what the new Israel has done in the knowledge that he has perfectly fulfilled all the things that we could not and by his love and grace, he stood in our place and gave us his own. So we don't hear the words of God that you're going to die wandering in the wilderness because you despised me, because you tested me time and time again. Instead, because of Jesus, he speaks, your sins are forgiven. Come, good and faithful servant, into the house that I have prepared before you in the home of my Father. Jesus has done what we cannot. His death and resurrection has freed us from our slavery to sin, and he has led us through the waters of our baptism to remove the stain of our sin that still clings to us. You're free. You no longer live under the condemnation of sin, under the just judgment of God, for Jesus stood there in your place and gave you his perfect righteousness. So what does the victory over the devil for Jesus in the wilderness show us? What does it mean for us? It means that in Jesus we are no longer Old Testament Israel. But we are the new Israel. Perfectly obedient children of God through the grace and love of Jesus. Brought there from his victory over all things that seek to drag us away from him. In the name of Jesus.